Poštovani sude. Your Honours, we heard many submissions from the prosecution about Perišić's alleged support of uh, the war, and especially about his actions which contributed to the crimes themselves. We uh, assert that this is not true and that this has not been proven. It is not a crime to uh, assist uh, in waging a war, and this is something that Mr. Guy Smith uh, referred to in his submissions. Uh, however horrible a thing war itself is. General Perisic headed the VJ general staff in the most difficult years in, uh, the, uh, in the time of crisis in the former Yugoslavia when the FRY was isolated under sanctions and exposed to constant attempts uh, to uh, uh, be drawn into the war by alleged friend and foe. Under the Constitution and in law, Perisic had the task of protecting the security and territorial integrity of the country, and he did carry out his professional obligation. To the regret of many, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was not drawn into the war, nor did the army of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia participate in the war at the time he was the chief of the general staff. C certain elements of the special unit's core did take part in Operation Panzer II in the area of Sarajevo in December and January, let's say December 1993 and January 1994, but this was an isolated case and in our submission the presence of the unit in Vogosha did it not have anything to do with the crimes which uh, were committed at the time, uh, and there is nothing to prove that they did have to do anything with them. The prosecution ignores many actions uh, taken by General Perisic uh, during and after the war, and which were directly related to the wish um, uh, that peace be established further human victims be uh, avoided and uh, new uh, conflicts uh, uh, be prevented from emerging. You cannot ignore it. I will mention only several events and uh, certain evidence uh, indicating what it was and how General Perisic uh, worked. Perisic should take most of the credit for the fact that around 1,000 Muslims uh, and their troops who had uh, swam uh, across the Drina River uh, fleeing uh, Zepa uh, on the 1st and 2nd August 1995 into the FRY for receiving those, some of whom are uh, expressed a wish to move on to other countries and others who remained as refugees within the FRY. Um, whatever the attempts to ignore this or to misinterpret the fact uh, that Perisic uh, did everything Uh, in respect of these uh, people who sought um, refuge in the FRY to uh, keep them within the FRY rather than have them return to the place they fled. Look at uh, testimony by witness Borovic at uh, transcript page 14003. And this, among other things, was the trigger that prompted uh, Milosevic to send a letter to both Mladic and Ali Izetbegovic to uh, um, ask them to stop the war, and the trigger was, in fact, uh, this incident where people swam across the Drina River, and this is in Exhibits D490 and 489. 
As for Perisic's role in the uh, liberation of the French pilots and uh, liberation of the French hostages, uh, uh, um, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, you've heard a great deal about it. You heard uh, the prosecution's interpretation of the ad evidence as well as the defences. I will not add to this uh, um, further since Mr. Guy Smith spoke of uh, um, the significance that the uh, freeing of the French pilots uh, had internationally. When we spoke of uh, influence and control uh, in our final brief, we explained uh, uh, to what direction his um, actions tended when he uh, dealt with General Mardich and uh, in, in what sort of role that ha this had in uh, the uh, war itself. General Clark, uh, and this is what expert trainer uh, 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 mentioned in paragraph 895, where he said that at the meeting with Tujman and Holbrook, um, Clark uh, said that Perisic, um, uh, in his view, uh, had uh, was unable to exert influence over Mladic. Perisic, throughout uh, his tenure at the head of the general staff, um, was afraid um, of the reactions the conflicts might have in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia uh, and the bearing it might have on the stability of the FRY. To uh, gain an insight into this, you can look to many minutes of the SDC uh, meetings where Perisic spoke of the various problems of the uh, potential for the conflict to spill over into the FRY and uh, uh, of uh, the problem which arose at the time, which was that of Kosovo. Unfortunately, his um, uh, foreboding proved true. The war in Kosovo uh, occurred in uh, 1999, and you also heard evidence uh, to the effect of uh, um, his role in fighting for uh, in, in asking that the war be averted. He didn't want the war in Kosovo. He feared it. and. Uh, saw it coming. That's why he signed uh, the agreement with General Clark. This is D752 um, about agreeing to the arrival of international observers in Kosovo. He was still the chief of the general staff. He did this because he knew what might happen if the uh, entire international community turned against them. A moment ago, I read out Milosevic's words from a, a, a meeting in 1995 about his fears as to what would become of Bosnia and Herzegovina if the entire international community turned against it. And I, why was it that Milosevic, um, th that these words slipped his mind when he uh, was contemplating the war in Kosovo? Because of this attitude of his towards the participation of the army and the war in Kosovo and avoiding the spread of conflict, Milosevic, under quotation marks, rewarded Perisic by dismissing him and even initiating criminal proceedings against him, demoting him altogether. I would like to refer to an episode that occurred while Perisic was still chief of general staff, and this was the focus of attention. We saw how many times he clashed with Milosevic. We saw the episode with General Boro Ivanovic, and this is directly linked to the evidence. However, there was something that happened in public for the first time. He took a position in relation to Milosevic's policy. General Perisic expressed that in 1997 during the so-called student protests. Perhaps I'm a bit partial when I say this, and a defense attorney should not be partial. We have adduced evidence showing that General Perisic did not allow the army to interfere in any way in that conflict 
between Milosevic and those who were protesting, and the, both the students and the opposition and the democratic public in the FRY and worldwide supported that. As for Milosevic, he distanced himself from him very clearly in public. This move was supported by the students who were protesting, of course, the democratic opposition in Serbia, in the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia at the time. I think that by then it was the State Union of Serbia and Montenegro. It was the first time that this came to the fore, this relationship between Milosevic and Perisic, and the international community recognized that. We wrote about that in our final brief, and we see all these moves that he took. And we are closing the circle by saying that when General Perisic was a member of the federal parliament of Serbia and Montenegro, he voted in favor of changing laws and regulations concerning cooperation with the Hague Tribunal, making it possible to have citizens of the country sent to the Hague Tribunal, those who were suspects and who were indicted. Mr. Perisic was the only one who then knew that he might be here before you, but he nevertheless voted in favor of that law and in having his fate put into your hands. Then, in his public statement concerning his voluntary surrender, he said that there was no dilemma in his mind as to whether he would appear before this tribunal because he said that that was the only way in which he would defend his honor the reputation of the army and the dignity of the people. In his introductory remarks when this trial started, he stated that he was confident that without prejudice, professionally and carefully, you will reach an honorable and fair judgment. Your honors, you are to assess these words of his without prejudice of that. And all of us who interpret the facts and events are full of prejudice. This should be done professionally and in the spirit of what the international community has entrusted you with, accepted standards in assessing innocence or responsibility. This is the priority of your task. Only after a, a judgment is reached in this way can the international community face the other part of the mandate that was given to this tribunal, justice for the victims and the return of trust among the peoples in the territory of the former Yugoslavia. That has to be the order taken, the sequence of events that should follow. First, the truth should be established, facts beyond reasonable doubt, I am going to use a social, societal term. It is the truth that has to be your priority, because on the basis of the truth, there can be justice for the victims. And it is only through justice for the victims that there can be reconciliation among the peoples of the former Yugoslavia. If you establish the truth, and if you free all of us of prejudice, all of us from the former Yugoslavia, then you would have accomplished your mission. We believe that General Perisic defended his honor before this court, the reputation of the army, and the dignity of the people. That is why we ask that he be acquitted of all charges in all counts of the indictment. Thank you for having given us this opportunity of making our closing arguments. Thank you. I am prepared to answer any questions you may have now. Thank you very much, Mr. Lukic. Mr. Harmon, any rebuttal? 
Yes, Your Honor. We have a few submissions. They won't take long, but we need the podium move from the defense side. Thank you. And the way we will, Your Honor, since Ms. McKenna will make submissions uh, first, Mr. Thomas will go next, and I will conclude. Thank you very much. Morning to you. Good morning, Your Honours. I'll be making two brief submissions in rebuttal. Firstly, the defence conflates the basis for Article 7.1 liability and Article 7.3 liability. The issue of whether a superior subordinate relationship existed between Perisic and members of the personnel centres is relevant only to an Article 7.3 analysis. Equally, the issue of whether personnel centre members were part of the VJ chain of command has no relevance to an assessment of Perisic's liability under Article 7.1. The defence conflates these issues. Throughout Mr Lukic's submission on Perisic's liability under Article 7.1 for the provision of personnel, he discussed whether the personnel centre members remained within the VJ chain of command. So, for example, at T14802, line 1 and onwards, with reference to the officers transferred to the VRS, he stated that from that moment onwards, they became part of that single chain of command. They had their own oath and they had their own superiors. They were part of a functioning army within their chain of command established by law. He then went on to undertake a detailed review of VRS documents relating to the appointment of certain officers to particular posts within the VRS in support of the defence proposition that those officers were solely within the chain of command of the VRS. And I will return to this issue of appointment in my second submission. But under Article 7.1, the relevant issue is whether Perisic provided assistance which had a substantial effect on the crimes committed. In the prosecution submission, this assistance included personnel, the provision of personnel through the personnel centres. However, an inquiry into whether the chain of command between Perisic and members of the personnel centres was broken when they were serving in the VRS whether they were under a dual chain of command while they were serving there, or whether Perisic continued to be their superior while they were in Bosnia and Herzegovina, is relevant only to an examination of Perisic's liability under Article 7.3. In the prosecution submission, by maintaining and sustaining the VRS officer corps through the personnel centres, including by ensuring that the officers' status rights would be fully protected and enjoyed while they were serving outside the fry by the effective regulation of those officers' service, thereby assuring the officers of their livelihood and assuring the VRS command, command of a solid command structure. 
Perisic's acts had a substantial effect on the crimes alleged. Turning to my very brief second submission, and this relates to appointments. The defence stated, with reference to the prosecution brief and the prosecution closing arguments, that it was the prosecution claim that Perisic had the authority to appoint within the VRS itself, and that's at T14831, line 23 and following. The defence misunderstands the prosecution position. As stated in the prosecution's closing arguments at lines T14689 and following, the prosecution does not dispute that the VRS and the SVK made the majority of decisions as to assignment to duty within those armies and that the duties to which those officers were assigned in the personnel centres reflected the decisions that had been made by the VRS and the SVK commands. And if I just, if I may move very briefly into closed session, Your Honour. Close of private? Or, sorry, private session. May the Chamber please move into private session. Interpreter's note, could the speaker please be asked to speak slower? We're back in all position, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Madam McKenna. The paragraph of the prosecution brief, paragraph 183, to which the defence referred in its submission, reads, having transferred VJ officers to the personnel centres, the VJ also regulated internal appointments to different units within the VRS and the SVK, ensuring the effective functioning of the personnel centre system. Your Honours, for the avoidance of any confusion, the prosecution does not suggest that Perisic made appointments within the VRS or the SVK. Rather, it is the prosecution's submission that while the VRS and the SVK made determinations as to appointments to particular duties within those armies in accordance with their needs of service, Perisic and the VJ had the ultimate authority as to whether an individual returned to the fry. And contrary to Mr Lukic's suggestion this morning, this was discussed, this issue was discussed in the prosecution's <coughs> closing submissions on Monday and is also discussed in the final brief and the prosecution's brief at paragraphs 190 to 193. Your Honours, unless you have any further questions, that concludes my submissions. Thank you, Madam McCann. Thank you, Your Honour. Mr Thomas. Thank you, Your Honours. I'd like to um, discuss briefly, Your Honours, a point made by my learned friend Mr Lukic yesterday, uh, elements of which have emerged again in his submissions to you this morning. A position that he took yesterday was that under the VJ law, under the law of the army, personnel transferred to the VRS or the SVK did not come under the responsibility of the VJ any longer as they had been assigned outside of the VJ and that therefore as a result Perisic did not have any obligation to discipline them if the need arise if the need arose or to otherwise um, carry out the duties of a superior. The position adopted by the defence was that in respect 
of such individuals signed outside of the VJ, that if anyone besides the Army's concerned, that is the VRS and the SVK, had that responsibility, that it was the Ministry of Defence. That position um, misunderstands the law of the VJ and it misunderstands the evidence relating to it. And what I would like to do, Your Honours, is to go through the parts, the transcript references, uh, and state the prosecution's position in relation to each uh, of the propositions made by my learned friend. And once I've done that, I will take Your Honours to the relevant legal provisions. But before I do, Your Honours, as a, as a brief introductory point, uh, it is trite after all of the evidence that we have heard that the law of the VJ did not contemplate the sending of VJ officers to another army. It does not provide for that. It simply does not contemplate it. Those are what the provisions of the law on the VJ state. And the evidence in relation to those provisions, Your Honours, is discussed in paragraph 172 of the prosecution's final trial brief. What the law on the VJ did permit was for the Chief of the General Staff to make assignments of VJ officers to units or organisations outside of the VJ, included, including the Ministry of Defence, but not limited to the Ministry of Defence. The law of the VJ, as I said, did not extend to sending officers to another army. General Perisic knew that. That's what he told the SDC when advocating for the formation of the personnel centres themselves. It was because of the complete absence of any legal basis to send officers to these armies that we have the personnel centres being advocated for in the first place. The benefits of those centres have been described in various ways, but one of the reasons for their genesis lay in the absence of any legal basis for what the Fry, the SDC, General Perisic were proposing and what they had been doing up until that point when he became Chief of the General Staff of the VJ. So, <clears throat> if I move before I move, Your Honours, to the transcripts. Having created the personnel centres, the difficulty arose as to how to legally categorise and classify these particular individuals for, amongst other things, the application of the law. How was the law on the VJ to apply to these officers? How were the regulations and laws relating to the regulation of status, promotion, other service rights, all things that apply to all servicemen supposed to apply to these people who now had been transferred out of the fry into Bosnia or Croatia in contravention of the law or in the absence of any express provision regulating that in the law of the VJ. The response of the courts, the response of the VJ itself, was to categorise these individuals as VJ members who had been assigned outside of the army. That is the language used throughout the military court decisions. <coughs> Excuse me, Lawrence. That is the language described throughout the military court decisions that we have seen tendered in this case. Thomas, uh, do you have a glass of water in front of you? It's actually something else, Your Honours. Let me just have a moment. The language used in the decisions of the Supreme Military Courts and other decisions 
is that these persons were governed by the laws relating to VJ servicemen because they were to be considered members of the VJ who had been assigned outside the army of the VJ, who had been assigned outside the VJ. And that is a term of art. It is a legal term of art that is drawn from the law of the VJ itself. It is language that is also used by uh, General Nikolic, uh, the systems and status related issues uh, chief from the Fry MOD when he testified. And this was a position that the VJ before, the VJ itself, before those military courts, never challenged. It was agreed in all of those proceedings resulting in all of the judgments that Your Honours have been provided with during the course of this trial, it was agreed by the VJ that these officers were VJ members serving outside the VJ, that that is the status that they enjoyed in terms of being able to classify them under the law of the VJ. I'd like to directly answer individual propositions made by my learned friend before going to those provisions, Your Honour. And Mr Registrar, if it is possible, I wonder if we could have yesterday's transcript, uh, T14811, uh, at line 25 on the screen. Now, Your Honours, if you go to line, if we can go to line 25, right. Mr. Lukic says at that point, even if they had been, and we're talking about the officers in the 30th and 40th personnel centres, even if they had been members of the VJ serving outside the VJ, they were no longer part of their chain of command. The Army of the Law of the Army of Yugoslavia, which is Exhibit 197, stipulates that precisely. Let me be very clear, it does not stipulate that. On the next page at line seven, the law on the Army of Yugoslavia is quite precise in respect of the status and rights and obligations of those serving outside the VJ. Yes, we are agreed. It is in respect of the rights and obligations of those termed as serving outside the VJ. They were definitely outside the chain of command of the Army of Yugoslavia under Article 8.2 of the law. No. That is incorrect, Your Honours. The only people who could possibly fall into that category, because they were expressly provided for in this respect, were VJ officers assigned to the Ministry of Defence. Those outside, sorry, those serving outside the VJ, the next line, they had the same rights and obligations as if they were members of the Army unless provided otherwise by the law. Well, there was no provision otherwise in respect of people serving in the 30th and 40th personnel centres. And yes, we agree that they had the same rights and obligations as if they were members of the army. If we move to page 812, line 20, please. It's there on the screen. My learned friend said, the law on the Army of Yugoslavia, Your Honours, has to do with the commanding officers serving outside the VJ, regulating their status in relation to their promotion, appointment to duty, transfer, and termination of service. Yes, up to that point, we agree with that submission. 
defining that these aspects lay solely with the Ministry of Defence. Absolutely not. It lay with the Ministry of Defence only in respect of servicemen assigned specifically to the Ministry of Defence. The Army of Yugoslavia, sorry, the next line down, Your Honours, the Army of Yugoslavia has no input, including the General Staff and its Chief, in relation to those assigned to the MOD. That is correct in respect of everybody else. Uh, that is mistaken. Page 813, line 5. If a VJ officer is serving outside the VJ, all of the aspects of his service were exclusively in the remit of those who were in charge of the armies where they served, not the VJ. That is stipulated by the law. Well, obviously, Mr. Lukic couldn't cite to any such provision. It doesn't exist in the law of the VJ, which does not contemplate anything of the sort. Page 813, line 11. The Army of Yugoslavia is competent to initiate disciplinary procedure only vis-a-vis -vis those people who are within the chain of command of the Army of Yugoslavia. Yes, agreed, but the position that Mr Lukic has miscalculated is that those who are assigned, VJ members who are assigned outside of the VJ, including the 30th and 40th as they were treated, still fall within this category under the VJ law. Disciplinary responsibility is retained by the VJ, and I will demonstrate that in a moment, Your Honours. In respect of the individuals who are outside the chain of command of the Army of Yugoslavia, for instance, the law refers to the Ministry of Defence, Article 181, confers the sole responsibility for the initiation of a disciplinary procedure upon the Ministry of Defence. Only, only, Your Honours, in respect of VJ servicemen assigned to the MOD. In respect of everybody else, that disciplinary responsibility is retained by the Army. So, let me take you to just several of these provisions which can illustrate that for you. Um, if we could have <coughs> uh, P197 on the screen, please, Mr. Registrar. I'm looking, please, first of all, for Article 8, which is on page 3 of the English, and page 2 in the BCS. Page three in the English, sorry, Mr. Registrar. Your Honour, this article, Article Eight, is the provision which states for us that service in the VJ includes service outside of the VJ. It's, include, it's referred to in the second paragraph of Article 8, which reads, service in the Army shall also include military and other duties in the Federal Ministry of Defence, other state organ, company or other organisation performed by professional members of the Army assigned there by the order of an authorised officer. 
here and after assignments outside the Army. Service in the Army shall include assignments outside the Army. Now, as I've said, there is no express inclusion of transfer to another Army, which of course is not contemplated for a moment by this law. But for the purposes of this law, the VJ and the courts, as I've already identified, treated 30th and 40th Personnel Centre officers as officers assigned outside the Army or serving outside the Army. Under Article 8, that is service in the VJ. So we begin there. If we could go to Article 152, please. And Mr. Registrar, that is on page 38 of the English and page 13 of the BCS. <coughs> now, Article 152, Your Honour, regulates a number of tasks or responsibilities of the Chief of the General Staff and commanding units, uh, promotion, appointments and so on, matters relating to the service of an individual. But paragraph 5 states that the Chief of the General Staff shall decide on the assignment of professional members of the Army to duties outside the Army, while assignment to the Federal Ministry of Defence shall be carried out at the request or with the approval of the Federal Minister of Defence or a commanding officer authorised by him. So we have for the first time the special category created of an assignment to the Federal Ministry of Defence as opposed to an assignment to any other duty outside of the VJ which remains within the sole remit of the Army. We go from there, Your Honours, to Article 158. which is on page 39 of the English, and I expect the next page in the BCS. Now, under Article 158, the ability of the MOD to regulate status or make decisions relating to the service of officers serving outside the Army, as claimed by my learned friend, is specifically limited to those who have been assigned to the Federal Ministry of Defence. Authorisation from Article 152 of this law to decide on service relations of professional soldiers and civilian personnel assigned to the Federal Ministry of Defence shall be carried out by the Federal Minister of Defence. That is the limit of the Federal Ministers of Defence's ability to decide on the service of anyone serving outside the VJ. VJ officers serving in the Federal Ministry of Defence only. If we move your honours to Article 53. <coughs> And Mr. Registrar, that's on page 13 in the English and page 5 in the BCS. Now, this provision, Your Honours, establishes that to all intents and purposes, there is little difference, none between an officer, a VJ officer serving in the VJ and a VJ officer serving outside the VJ. Article 53, the second paragraph. A professional officer or non-commissioned officer assigned outside the Army shall have the same rights and 
duties of professional officers and non-commissioned officers assigned to the Army unless otherwise stipulated by this law. And there is no such otherwise stipulated. So, VJ officers serving outside the Army have the same rights and duties as VJ officers serving in a VJ duty or post. Well, what happens if a VJ officer serving outside the Army commits a disciplinary infraction or offence? For that, Your Honours, we go to Article 159. Page 39. Thank you, Mr. Registrar. You're way ahead of me. Right. A service member who violates military discipline in the performance of his service or in connection with the performance of his service shall be held responsible for disciplinary infractions or disciplinary offences. There is no distinction drawn in this provision between an officer serving in the VJ, a VJ officer serving in the VJ, or a VJ officer serving outside the VJ. Under Article 8, service in the VJ includes both. So a service member under Article 9, under Article